Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Till All Are One, and I have a guest with us, our first interview here on Till All Are One. I'm so excited because he wrote four amazing episodes of Transformers, or four, four issues, I'm sorry, uh, called Transformers Galaxies, and it was all about the Constructicons. It was an amazing series. We reviewed the uh, issues here on the show, so if you haven't watched those yet, please go back and watch them, but make sure you go buy the issues first. I think they're going to be releasing them in a hardcover soon, and hopefully in their own trade paperback at, at some point down the road too, but the writer of that series is Tyler Blazinski. Tyler, thanks so much for being here today, sir. Hey, it's my pleasure, Seek. It's great to join you. Hey, awesome. And yeah, it's great to have you, man. And and you know, I've been reviewing Transformer stuff, you know, from toys and and uh, movies and everything over the years. You were the first person uh, to actually uh, read who worked on these books, uh, besides Livio Ramondelli, who's also the artist of this book with you. Um, you're the first person outside of him to uh, to retweet and actually watch my review and say some kind words. So I want to thank you for that and connecting with me on that level. It means a lot. Hey, honestly, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of new to writing comics and it was a new experience for me. So I, uh, I wanted to make sure that I connected with some other hardcore Transformers fans. And from watching a review, I could tell that you were, you were one of one of us so <laughs> it was appeal it was appealing to me in that sense not just because you liked the series but uh because i did watch some reviews and read some reviews that weren't as kind to my series um but i i honestly i i wanted to hear from the people that were like me and wanted to make sure that i that I made them happy because that was something that was uh that was important to me when i started out on this journey when you did, I mean, you, you wrote the Constructicons, which are some of my favorite Transformer characters, and also the Insecticons, which are other favorites of mine. And that's the thing is you'll notice a lot if we get into it in this episode. I have a lot of favorites. I would just going to say that <laughs> pro probably all of the Transformers are my favorite uh, because I can never pick one ever. Um, but that does lead me to my first question, and I feel like it's the most obvious place to start, which is uh, uh, when did you become a Transformer fan, and who are some of your favorites uh, when you first started watching the show? So I became a fan, I, I think, uh, pretty much my brother and I, uh, my younger brother, he was three years younger than me. Um, this was the mid-'80s, and Transformers were a thing. They became huge pretty quickly. I, I don't know if you collected the GoBots or not, but the GoBots <laughs> actually released first. Right. Um, and and I think my brother and I both got a single GoBot each, and then the commercial started to run for Transformers, and basically we tossed the GoBots aside super quick uh, <laughs> because we saw how cool the – the toys uh, for the Transformers were both like kind of the size and the scale of them, um, and then they had a really cool cartoon that went along with it. That that uh, you know it was basically one big commercial for the toys. But my brother and I kind of like got deep into the fiction and then loved watching the series. And it was so simple in the beginning when you had basically the Seekers and Soundwave and and Megatron because I was a Decepticon guy. He collected the Autobots. <laughs> or as I like to call them, the Autobots. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I just thought the Decepticons were so much cooler and with their jets and their they had a black and purple one. He was my very first Transformer, was Skywarp, and absolutely loved it, loved that he was this incredible military jet and um, just thought, Man, like, who wants to collect these cars on the ground when you collect can collect these things that go like Mach one and shoot sh shoot these incredible missiles? And Megatron turns into a into a gun. And like, my my mom had like this strict rule that we couldn't have you know toy guns in the house, but she didn't really realize that Megatron, like this robot, transformed into this. Uh, Walther P thirty eight. That so it was like also kind of like my first toy gun that I was able to have basically without her realizing she was totally ignorant of it. But, um, but yeah, it was like, it was, it was really, I had had a lot of toys up until that point. We had done a little bit of GI Joe. We had collected a little bit of He-Man, but once Transformers came out, my brother and I were totally hooked and it would, it would, it became, it quickly became our number one franchise, even above like star Wars and, um, Spider-Man and some of the other things that we grew up with, like Transformers became 
almost a biblical relationship. And then as as things progressed with Transformers and they released newer and newer ones, obviously, like, uh, if you remember the cartoon, the pretty much the most famous thing Megatron said over and over again was Decepticons retreat in every episode. <laughs> so uh, I, as a Decepticon fan, I got really frustrated with that. And, and I remember the moment that they introduced Devastator in the show. And that, to me, was like maybe one of my greatest moments of my childhood because I, I thought for once the Decepticons were finally going to win. Like, like <laughs> it, 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 And, you know, lo and behold, they didn't. But at least it gave me that charge and that thrill like they were going to win. So um, it's interesting that you talk about favorites just because, I, you know, probably my number one favorite is Devastator and the Constructicons. And so it was really, truly... Um, an honor for me to be able to write an origin story for them. Um, it would, it would be like, and I, I was made kind of like the same analogy. It would be like anybody who was a big Batman fan, able to write kind of the, the Bruce Wayne's parents getting killed story again. Um, but because it was, but it, it, it is analogous, but it's also not analogous because the the Constructicon's only origin story was the Robo Smasher and that episode in the Secret of Omega Supreme where they didn't really have a chance to like make a choice to become evil like Megatron brainwashed them into becoming evil so it was it was fantastic to be able to put a new spin on it and and basically introduce the Constructicons in a way and have them personalized and humanized. That in a way that they'd never been before. Yeah, I mean, I've I'm a big fan of uh, a lot of Decepticons, especially Devastator and the Constructicons. And I remember like reading your first issue and being just blown away by that level of detail and uh, about like you know your focus on their psychology and almost like the their place in classism. Um, and then also like. I've been a blue collar guy my whole life. Like I, I, I know there's been a couple times where I've worked in fields of entertainment or comic books, but uh, even in those areas, I was working the nine to five jobs, the Monday through Friday jobs, and so seeing these guys uh, who were basically construction workers, uh, you know, go through this traumatic event and then try to deny themselves that experience again out of fear, um, and then it dampened their creativity. It was, I don't know, there were so many things about it that I just found insanely relatable and it made them see, it made me, a, a guy who's been, re, you know, a fan as long as you've been a fan, uh, see them in a completely new way. And so, uh, so I urge anyone out there who did not read Transformers Galaxies issues one through four, please go check them out. Go, go ask your local comic store for them. Like I said, I think they're going to come out in a hardcover and hopefully in their own soft cover at some point. That would be fantastic. Um, they're they're actually coming out in hardcover in July 29th, so oh, you can go you can go pre-order it now uh, on Amazon or any like a, maybe your local comic book shop can get it in for you. Um, it's it I mean it's gonna it's what's fun about it now being able to talk about it now is that all four issues are, are out there. Right. So like it's I I still don't want to spoil things for people, sure. but for me it's interesting that you're bringing up the classism issue because. Uh, to me, it was like there was a level of not being appreciated by society. Right. Um, right. The people, the people, people who were out there working on your roads, who like, who somebody you know you you view as an inconvenience because you're trying to get to to a haircut appointment or take your kid to uh, you know um, their basketball practice or whatever whatever it is that you're doing, you just view these these people as an impediment and they're people that keep an infrastructure around us functioning and working and being as, as a part of like society and like they made all these sacrifices to make society better but they were never um, appreciated and hailed kind of as the heroes that they were for it uh, and that's kind of the that, that was a to me, I was trying to capture the psychology of how that would make you feel. Not only not be rewarded for it, but as eventually being thrown aside like trash. Right, dismissed because for they, it. Because they, ma they made the sacrifice for it. Right. You know, the other thing, and not to go too deep into this hole, but 
I really wanted to give the Constructicons individual personalities, like, because to me, like, any of the combiner teams and any of the cartoons, like, none of them really had, like, really distinct individual personalities. The Dinobots kind of did, but, like, nobody on the combiner side did. Um, All we knew that was that Scrapper was the leader, Um, but, and that Law Hall occasionally complained because he had to you know, he was kind of comedic relief because, oh, I, I, I didn't sign up to be a dump truck. Like, <laughs> why do I got to carry all this stuff? And like, so that was kind of how they were viewed. But I, I wanted, I viewed the com- combiner teams kind of like siblings, you know, like, like they were all, they all shared a common connection. They all might have like kind of come together for a purpose. Um, but they all had their distinct personality and they kind of had to figure out a way to coexist. So, you know, you, you have like kind of the psychotic brother for lack of a better term in bone crusher. You've got the little, you've got the little brother who's always trying to like prove his worth to everybody else. Like scavenger. Like I drew, I, I grew up with four brothers. So like in, in, to me, it was very natural for me to write a combiner team because I drew from the experiences of my brothers around me. Like, like, like I could point to each one of the Constructicons and tell you which one of my brothers' like personality I kind of drew from for each one of them. Like, it, it, and it's it, and it was funny. Like, I, I Scrapper is most definitely me. Like, <laughs> of of all of them, like Scrapper is me. He was also he also happened to be my favorite Constructicon, so it meant a lot to be able to to give him kind of like uh a real high place uh i was really bitter when idw like sorry for those who haven't read continuity one but i was really sad when they killed off scrapper like um i I, and and not only did they kill him off but they killed him off with a freaking human so it was like (laughs) it was like are you kidding are you kidding me right now like of all the things like he gets beat down beat to death by a human um, so that, that to me was like literally offensive. It was part of like, it was part of what got, got me going and wanting to like write for this and, and kind of correct the, the sins and give them an appropriate story. So even in continuity one, when they introduced the Constructicons, they still didn't give them very much personality at all. They kind of just served to function as like these wacko individual guys who formed into a giant monster. I wanted to like flesh that out, make them into individual personalities and what a struggle it would be if you were all these really individual people trying to come together as, as one being and work as one, like how difficult would that be to like, to be able to execute as a combiner if you have all these individual personalities. Yeah. I mean, you took uh, teamwork to a new level with this version because yeah, that first issue you had this scene where they're all sitting around talking and there's a clear voice for each of them. They each have their own point of view. They each have their own opinions about what happened to them, how they were discarded. Some don't exactly feel fully discarded. They feel like they're still useful and working on stuff. And then the other ones are like trying to convince them. And there's like real dialogue and real issues going on there between them. But yeah, when they combine, it's a completely different story. It approaches combining in a new way that I've never even thought about while reading these characters before. But also, like you said, you do such a great job laying the groundwork of how different they are. So you you are with them on the struggles when in issues two and three when they're combining and they can't stay in the combined form because they can't succumb to the Devastator personality because that would mean they all have to agree, which they clearly don't when they're separate. So I just, I love that. That felt so organic and such a great build up and, uh, and, and the payoff felt very earned. So when they finally were Devastator, you were like, Yes, let's screw, let's mess stuff up now. Uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean that was to, to me. I had a very clear idea in mind as to how I wanted the arc to go because it, it was. A, I mean, to be perfectly honest, it was a little bit challenging to. Uh, and one of the criticisms I've seen in my series is that um, the heel turn was too too sudden. Like mm-hmm. it was, 
it was too out of left field. Like they were good, good, build, build, build. And then suddenly they decided, oh, we're just going to like level everything. But to me, it was like I was trying to show and that was the entire purpose of issue three was to show just how long ago they were discarded and discarded in a nefarious way. It wasn't right. like <laughs> it was they weren't discarding them like they were basically like trying to save their own hides by shipping this thing off because they saw that the constructicons didn't always have fully have control o- over it so they were afraid of it mm-hmm. so uh they wanted to get it away from them and keeping them in low energy mode would like kind of ensure that they were they were basically like chained and that they couldn't they couldn't like exact vengeance in that sense so and they use it as like they use the low energy thing as like everybody's got to do their greater part for the for the entire cybertronian race and right i just i wanted to show that they had um that they did have motive because you know they were never ever ever going to escape that they're they're basically were imprisoned without being imprisoned like for right. lack of a better sure, sure. analogy and so they were never going to escape those shackles if you know the opportunity didn't present themselves and you know the uh, the the senate and the autobots were ignorant and that like they didn't realize that they were opening themselves up to it by already having the insecticons banished there for very similar reasons because they were afraid of them so uh it wound up like being a perfect moment for them to kind of seize their own destiny if then if that meant that a bunch of random uh random transformers wound up having to get killed and annihilated for them to get their own freedom to them like it was worth it at that point uh like you get you can only get pushed so far um before you i think realize that that you have no other alternative than this and i think that's kind of like i tried to get that in in four issues without it feeling without it feeling forced and i hope that it it is uh i mean i probably could have done it and six easier but you know i was given four so it's kind of <laughs> it was the way it was so um and i know a lot of people had trouble with issue three because you know there wasn't a whole lot going on other than dialogue and them talking through things but but i wanted to lay the foundation for the carnage in issue four right no it makes sense and uh, and when you talked earlier about how unappreciated they feel like i've done landscaping and construction before in my life and i i even then, I felt stuff like that. So I remember reading this and connecting with these guys on that level because I, I either I remember this time I was uh, doing this big big yard and I did a I was doing it with a push mower, so not even like a uh, you know a riding mower. And we just I wanted to go in a certain pattern so that the grass looked nice and clean and you know didn't have circles in it from the riding mower. And there someone littered right on the yard as I was cutting it, <laughs> and it's just like oh my god. And it's just one of those things where I'm like. Oh yeah, I guess I'm not a human being here, like working really hard out in the sun, you know. Like, um, but that's how it is sometimes for those jobs. And so, to, for you to capture that, I thought was great because a blue collar angle is not something that you typically think about when you're like, oh, I'm reading a Transformer comic, I'm going to get this big intergalactic battle. And then here, it's the aftermath of a, a big battle. And like you said, these guys were on Cybertron rebuilding it, and they get discarded because of their 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 ability you know the thing that makes them special is the thing that made yeah. everyone else afraid of them and so no i like that and as an x-men fan i like that too because that's what i feel like the x-men always get cast out because they're special um so no i love yeah, it and then and, and then termagax honestly like basically talks them into becoming devastator it isn't even like it's they basically make the sacrifice to like first become the combiner sorry i didn't mean to use devastator but sure. because he technically isn't devastator until later on but right. but they become the combiner because it, it'll make their job easier like it'll make it faster for them to be able to rebuild cybertron um or or iacon so right. like they make this sacrifice decide to do something that that most of them are hesitant to do like they don't they don't really want to do it but they're doing it for the greater good because they know that that's their role and that's what they signed up for when they picked like kind of like what their future was and uh and then to be to be cast aside for it when you make that sacrifice i mean just imagine the imagine the 
the anger that you would feel over it. I, I just like to me that was that was kind of what I tried to portray, um, hopefully successfully. Well, I, I think you did. You know my review, and if anyone else wants to go out there and, and watch it, uh, you know I'll put a link down below. But I'll also put a link down below to the hardcover of the version that's coming out of, that has these four issues in it. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. And if you're into digital comics, you can buy them right now on Comicsology. Uh, I highly recommend Transformers Galaxies one through four. Uh, but we talked a little bit about Transformers, but there are other things because like I like to do research on you know people I'm interviewing, and I found some stuff out about you that I was like, oh my god, this is going to be really exciting to talk about uh, for me personally. Um, so we'll dip back into Transformers here in a second, but I do want to kind of talk about, um, you know, where what kind of your origins are. Like you said, this is one of your your first comic book actually that you wrote. But before that, you um, you know you were into blogging. You uh, you created the Athletics Nation, which you know became uh, SB you know Sports Blog Nation, uh, SB Nation, uh, and then that's grown even more over the years too. So I'd love to talk a little bit about back that, but maybe starting at the beginning and kind of what. What gave you that umph and that inspiration to to start your own blog and focus on the athletic uh, A's or the Oakland uh, the Oakland Athletics? I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, I I was trained. I have a degree in journalism, uh, and journalism was kind of like my background. So, uh, and I loved like writing and being a part of. Uh, I actually wrote fiction in college and. Like I, any kind of writing, I, I just loved to do. Um, and I got a job as a sports writer right out of college. So I covered some local high school sports here in Orange County. I live in Orange County, California. Um, and I covered some local sports. Uh, I, I'm, tr- I'm going to try and make this as short as humanly possible. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a weave to all of this, but I'll try and make it as short as I can. So um, I covered – local high school sports uh, I went on to be like a city reporter for the San Gabriel Valley Tribune um, which is you know uh, out in kind of like the Azusa Pomona area um, and then after after that I, I met the love of my life uh, and my wife my current wife of 22 years um, she was also studying to be a reporter and uh Journalists are not paid very well. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but especially print journalists. Right. Um, so I, I decided to make a move into public relations because one of us needed to make a little bit of money or we were going to be basically, you know, uh, on food stamps the rest of our lives. So um, so I, I decided to move to public, re- public relations for financial reasons. And uh, while I was working in the public relations industry, I, I never – quit wanting to write and I happened to be an Oakland A's fan and uh, and I also had a background in journalism and I realized there was kind of a market hole for like nobody was really there were there were like message boards that that were on ESPN.com and there were a few blogs here and there but nobody was really covering the A's that I wanted the way that I wanted it covered mm-hmm. um, so I decided that uh, I had a good friend who knew all about blogging and he kept talking me and he kept saying you should blog about the A's because I kept talking to him about my opinions on the A's and whatnot. He was like, just do it in a blog and you'll get much more feedback. And so I launched uh, Athletics Nation in November of 2003. Uh, Started on like a free site uh, just to see if I liked it. I loved it. Uh, Basically, I was more like a fan porter for lack of a better term, okay. it was like a fan reporter, uh-huh. um, and I and I and, and I never had kind of the veil of objectivity that I think that a lot of reporters had back in that time. Like, let's face it, nobody is really objective when they're covering a professional sports team. They they say they are, but they're not because right. because. I know for a fact that people were really harsh to Barry Bonds back in the day because he was kind of a dick to them. Like, <laughs> like, a, like, and I'm no fan of Barry Bonds, so let's just get that out there. Okay. But he he also never received great coverage because he treated the reporters like shit. Right. So I'm um, oh sorry sorry bad language. Uh, so um, he he didn't treat the reporters well. So. 
that ultimately affected the way they covered him. I mean, they could say it didn't, but we're all human beings. Right. Like we, by by nature, we are subjective creatures. We are not objective creatures in the way that we view things. We have personal opinions, personal backgrounds, personal uh, thoughts about things. We try to be as objective as we can, and that's the goal of journalism. But I basically just removed it when I created Athletics Nation. It turns out that a lot of people were hungering for that kind of coverage in sports. So it blew up pretty quickly. Um, Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland Athletics, became a friend of mine. Um, I, I got to meet and interview Michael Lewis, who was the author of Moneyball. Uh, he and I still trade emails to this day because he's one of the smartest human beings I've ever met in my life. Um, it just like it blossomed into something way bigger because I realized that there were other people out there who were writing on Blogspot or WordPress or any of the TypePad, any of the sites that were available at that time, right. uh, who were writing about who were writing about other teams, and I started recruiting them, saying, "Hey, you know, maybe we can create some kind of audience and sell advertising to the audience." Well, the audience grew, but we didn't really fig- we didn't really understand the business aspect of it particularly well. Um, so we wound up like the audience grew pretty quickly. We got into like the ten million uh, view area pretty quickly um got the attention of a former aol executive uh who actually tried to put us out of business at one point he was running a a rival network (laughs) called fan house Mm -hmm. um but he wound up investing his own money into our our site uh and then came aboard eventually as ceo when we took our series a funding excuse me and we started strictly as a as a sports blogging network um but he he had grander visions to turn it into other verticals because other places where people were also passionate about things so consumer technology so he launched the verge he launched um he launched a variety of other sites polygon uh curved eater racked some of these other sites we acquired and he turned he basically turned it into vox media um and uh, I sort of ran the sports blogging side of things uh, on the editorial side for quite a few years, um, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I, I had a blast doing it, um, but it also like kind of grew beyond my control. Uh, so I was the founder along with my partner who, who originally helped me out, and. Um, and when we decided to kind of like uh in i think it was 2015 Mm -hmm. um comcast Comcast acquired a portion of the company i basically decided to you know not not fully retire i'm still consulting with the company on the sports side because i have a long history with it and i understand i still understand the market pretty well Mm -hmm. um but i stepped away from the full-time position to to really kind of start to pursue the comics and and other other interests that I had, and basically be a full time dad. So, right. um, I had a big impact on me because my father passed away when he was forty seven. So uh, he died of a heart, he died of a sudden heart attack when I was eighteen years old, and uh, and that had a big impact on me because I realized that he. He, was, he wasn't around very much because he was working really, really hard to keep a roof. I mean, he had five boys and a wife and a mortgage and all these other things, and he basically worked himself to death. Like, he, he didn't really take care of himself because he was, on, he was constantly commuting into Cambridge. I lived in Massachusetts at the time. Mm-hmm. He commuted into Cambridge. He, like, he, he didn't eat very well. He smoked. He was like... And I decided that, like, when I had a family of my own one day, that I was going to want to, like, be a very different father. I wanted my kids to know me. I wanted them to, like, to have a really good recollection and warm memories of me. And that made a really big impact that he passed away so young that I wanted to make sure that I got years with my children where they, they knew their father and they knew how important it was to have that family and have that connection with that person around you. So it, it gave me that opportunity in 2015. I mean, and even more so, it gave me the opportunity to pursue being able to write 
Transformers comics and the, the common thread between both my Transformers comics writing and what I did with uh, Athletics Nation and SB Nation and Vox is I saw something that that I loved that I didn't think was being done the way that I wanted it done and um, I my wife always calls me the most stubborn person she's ever met in her entire life so um <laughs> I th- and I think she means it as a compliment sure. because because it motivated me to want to change the sports coverage industry and it motivated me to want to change a little bit about what they were doing with Transformers comics like like I told you earlier the whole scrapper scene of him dying it was like I I was like I have to like tell a better story because it's important it's important to me that that fiction be corrected out there in the universe so i wanted to put an energy out there that and i think when you have that passion when you have that that drive behind you to want to see something better um in something that you really really care about then then you do it like it's it's even like i saw what my dad did i wanted to change it like for my kids and my the next generation so i took the opportunity to try and change the narrative of how how a dad should be with his kids so i i mean i don't know if that makes any sense but they're all kind of interconnected i get the drive behind me um it's funny because my wife told me after i found out that i was having my i told her uh i told her i'm gonna try and have a transformers comic uh, published like and she she just said okay i think you'll wind up doing this because <laughs> she learned after after doubting me with the sb nation thing that right. like that i'm when i'm driven about something that it's going to happen come hell or high water like because it's just something that i want to make happen that I'm, and so she she jokingly said to me after i got the after i got my first issue she said, "Can you just decide you're going you're going to run for president of the United States, please? <laughs> like, <laughs> because I think you know we need we need something at that level changed right now as well. So I'm like, yeah, I don't really want that, but um, but I I, I mean, it's just funny because she jokingly thinks that like whatever I decide to set my mind to, that it's going to happen. So, um." You know, one. So I, I know that was very. I know that was very long winded, <laughs> but it's it's kind of, it's kind of a long roundabout story about how it. Ha- I mean, summarizing how that company came to be is not an easy task. <laughs> no, I know that's and it's funny because I was like, well, I split that over into three questions, and you very graciously answered it all in one answer, which was really nice. <laughs> um, but but I, but to take a minute here to reflect on that because I love my favorite thing about asking questions like that and hearing a, a, an answer like yours is. Is, is connecting to the things that you're talking about. And for me, um, you know, my grandfather, he, he sounds a lot like your dad. He, wor- he worked all the time. Uh, he had, my grandfather and my grandmother uh, had nine kids. Um, they actually had 13, but there was four miscarriages. Um, oh, wow. So, so they're very... Yeah, my, my mom had a few as well. She was... The reason there were, I have four brothers is she kept trying for a girl. So yeah. there you go. Well, that was my grandparents. Kept, <laughs> they kept trying for a boy. He had well, he did have one son, but he had eight girls. Um, wow. Yeah, he he wanted nine boys to make his own baseball team, and he ended up with eight, <laughs> eight, eight girls and one boy. Um, but uh, I can respect that. Yeah, no, for I bet she can. <laughs> we were we're from Pittsburgh, so he was a big Pirates guy, um, and so that's how we know Barry Bonds is from Pirates. Um, and, uh, Roberto Clemente too. Yeah, and Roberto Clemente, one of the best baseball players um, ever. Yeah, ever. Yeah, number twenty-one. Um, yeah. So he. Uh, so when you're saying that, like, I mean, I see that in my mom. My mom and all of her sisters, they're hard workers. Uh, some of them have passed because of how much they work, how how much they exert themselves. I, well, you know, I don't have a ton of memories as my childhood, but the ones I do have, I just remember me and my brother. I, my mom wasn't. She was there, but she wasn't like. It wasn't at the same time because she had to work two, sometimes three jobs to make sure we were fed, and um, and so I noticed that in myself. Like I work every day, whether I'm working on a book because I'm writing a novel right now, or I'm doing you know the podcasting, um, or I'm out looking for a job, which I you know I just got one. So it's like no matter what it is, I have to work, and I don't know if I'm repeating the mistakes of the past or in a different way for me. 
if working helps me keep going because I'm, you know, 10 years past my actual expiration date and yeah. I, and I can't actually think of anything to do other than work because it just keeps me active, it keeps me going, but I know the dangers of it too. I get told by my doctor all the time. So hearing you, the hardest thing, I think anything, anyone can do the hardest thing is to to step out of the hamster wheel that we all are walking in. And for yeah. you for you to understand and be impacted so profoundly by what happened with you and your father and go, I don't want to risk that for my own kids and realizing, yeah, maybe you're stubborn, maybe you know your wife's right about that, about you know, you are an advocate for change. You you saw something and you're like, this can be better. And you're you put yourself out there to bring that change and you did and even still, after you brought that change, you were like, now I got to step away because something more important than just bringing this change has arisen. Like I read an interview with you where you talked about how, you know, you're like, my daughter, she really loves me right now. But in a couple years when she's a teenager, she's going to hate me probably. And you said, so you're like, so I want to be there um, and not be distant. And I want, you know, to have those years with her. And now hearing you tell me that part makes a lot of sense. So, you know, yeah, you you maybe are stubborn to some degree, but to notice that it, 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 you you have one foot in the stubborn side and one foot in the awareness side, and it's it, to hear you step out of your hamster wheel for me. I mean, it, it gives someone like me a lot of hope because I just see me and my family just going through that same hamster wheel, and I know it's not good for any of our health. So, I just on a personal level, I just want to thank you for sharing that story with us. Well, it's funny that you say that because um, one of the things I and you know I'm a big advocate for um, for psychotherapy. Um, I I I started probably way too late in my life, but I I started about two years ago. Um, my stepfather actually was dealing with uh, a, a pancreatic cancer, and um, and and. And I was taking on a lot on my shoulders, like in terms of taking care of my mom and my stepdad. And uh, there's a lot of other issues there, but I wound up getting in psychotherapy b because of it. And one of the, one of the things that has come out of psychotherapy is talking about like the messages that you receive when you're a child. Mm -hmm. And one of the messages that I received when I was a child over and over again is that there's nothing worse than being lazy. Like, yeah. uh, if you're a lazy person, you're basically a useless person and you might as well just go give up your life right now. That was the message. I'm not saying that that's what I believe, sure. but that was what I heard repeatedly as a kid. Like, yeah. like, so like I was an unbelievable workaholic through like, through my twenties, through my thirties. Like I, I started a paper route when I was 11 years old because my dad believed that you had to start working. Like, and, uh, and I was saving for my own college because he didn't believe in paying for our college either. So, uh, I was saving for my own college from 11 years old. Uh, I started being a bag boy at like uh, the local supermarket at 14. Mm -hmm. I worked at, uh, I worked at, uh, Burger King, uh, for three years in high school, 30 hours a week. Like I was a hard worker. Like I worked really, really hard and it turned out that, um, as I got older and as my kids got older, I realized that I was following exactly what my dad had done mindlessly. Like I was doing, I was trying to find self worth and not being lazy, you know, like, right. and, and as long as I'm not lazy, I'm a good person. Like, like that was really when as in truth, we only have one life that we're given to us. Like, like once we're gone, that's it. Like, and to me, the most important thing that I'm ever going to do on this planet, no matter whether I write comic books, whether I start a multi or multi million dollar media company, whether I, you know, no matter what I do from a professional standpoint, the most important thing that I do will be to leave two good humans uh, on this planet that can raise more good humans as they go forward with their life so to me it was really really important that um, I spend as much time with my kids to make sure that they have those values and I, I mean my wife will tell you 
even though uh, I'm not working full time, I work really, really hard right now. Like whether it's like doing things around the house or like uh, I'm full on Mr. Mom when it comes to my <laughs> kids. Like it's just, and I do a lot of things because my wife's actually working a full time job from home right now. So, um, so, and we get to spend a lot, a lot of extra time together because I'm home. Things, things, and it was funny because late last year like um we were doing uh there was talk of me doing another job or doing something and both my kids freaked out they were like no we don't want you to go back to work we want you still driving us to school and doing all these other and i was like like their reaction was like really violently negative so i was like I, I was like, you know, maybe I'm spoiling spoiling them a little much because most most kids don't have their dad around like I am. Right. So, but at the same time, I also wanted to be when I'm gone that I did everything that I could to raise two good, productive human beings who have good values. So, um, and there's again, when they write your tombstone, uh, they they don't say beloved entrepreneur <laughs> beloved comic book writer yeah they write beloved husband father brother friend whatever right. Right. like so to me those are the most important things you can do in your life not necessarily what you're able to accomplish with your career even if you're steven spielberg like truthfully like um what what you do with your family and what you do for that next generation is way more important yeah amen um yeah. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, you know it's great and um it's hearing that. I mean, but you're 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 right and it's it hearing you talk about legacy and 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 the the focus shift. Like I said, it's like you're a, you're in a way, you're an agent for change for sure because like you said you saw a way something was happening in the world as far as sports go and you're like, "Oh, I want to bring some kind of change to that." And then you did. And then now you were like, "Oh, let's look internally." What can I change about me that gives my kids a better chance and gives my family a better chance and I'm where I'm a better dad and a better father and just hearing that is it's refreshing, man. It's not a topic I get to talk about much on my show and uh, you know a lot of people they just come here for the comics and the things, but there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of real world things out there that happen, which is why I wanted to talk about this portion of your life because I, I you know everything we do shapes us and everything we do puts us on the path of you know consistency or change and i see you constantly veering into the change lane and i'm just in, in, in immensely impressed by it so um so if i can i'm going to put us in the change lane and we're going to turn back to transformers sure um but i'm going to say like you know to segue into that you know obviously hearing about the time you spent with your family is great so you know I'm glad to hear that's been going well. And so how did, you know, doing that and, and being home more, how did that lead you to a path where you made connections to where you could even pitch a, a story for IDW for Transformers? So, yeah, um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, I will say that the having the box on, on my resume definitely did help uh, open some doors for me. Um, because, you know, I, I think IDW obviously wanted to reach, you know, as many people as possible with the books and sure. like people knowing, knowing my name, not, not, I'm, I mean, I'm like a E-list celebrity, so it's not like a, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm certainly not uh, somebody who will bring a whole lot of readers, but, but uh, being able to like have that background of Vox and um, show that I can you know, build an audience, I think was, was an interesting path into this. Uh, I started, I honestly started spending money on my own dime to go to shows like Comic Con and, um, and I, I went to one, Wonder Con actually was where I met Levio. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I met Levio there. He and I had a pretty good connection. I had been pitching IDW already, uh, because, I knew I met a comic book writer through my brother who knew somebody at IDW um, and made the connection with me to somebody at IDW, one of the editors, and they told me to go ahead and send some of the pitches. So I met them in person, uh, talked with them about my vision for the constructor cons. I pitched probably 
I would guess at least four different Constructicon stories before uh -huh. this one got approved. Yeah. Um, the the four other ones were kind of like I, I was trying to shoehorn them into their old continuity. Right. Um, I was actually trying to bring Scrapper back, believe it or not, um, <laughs> and, and, and the old continuity. Uh, but things opened up, and a great opportunity opened up when they decided to kind of relaunch with the new continuity. Um, and that they decided that they wanted to do some galaxy stories and they had other people pitching stories. Um, so they decided that was going to be the route that they were going to take. They were going to use galaxies as kind of like the off world, still connected to the continuity, but different. Mm -hmm. And I, I met a few of them at, um, uh, at comic con and we talked over some of the stories. I sent them formal written pitches um, that outlined what I wanted to have happen. They really liked the story, and then I kind of sealed the deal by meeting my editor, David Marriott, at a TF Con, and we went over, like, kind of finalizing how it would be approached, and we decided that it would be the first four issues of Galaxies. So, to be, to be frank, you know, I had some doors open for me by relationships that I had previous, previously. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, my, my, previous experience helped because they knew of me um and then uh and honestly it was a great it was a big learning curve for me to learn how to write comics uh it i i had been used to writing journalism stories and i even like wrote a book in college uh fiction book but um but this was a completely new experience for me because uh there's really an economy of words uh, that need to happen in a comic book. Um, and, you know, even reading it now, there's like certain things that I'm like, oh God, I wish I had, you know, done this a little bit more. Um, but you really like have a very limited amount of space as a writer to be able to flesh out any of this stuff. Or, and so working with Livio was absolutely fantastic. He was, he's one of the most easygoing, wonderful people that I've ever met in my life and I'm not just talking about the comics industry um, he was a real cheerleader for me he loved the story I actually paid him for a commission to do a Devastator uh, before we ever wound up working together yeah. um, of, and, I, and I did it from one of the stories that I had written previously and I had already written like two and a half issues of another um, another constructed con story and he wrote something from that issue that's hanging on my son. I mean, he drew something from that series that's like hanging on my son's wall right now. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, it was a great experience. I learned how I, I tailored my scripts to Livio's process. Livio's process, mm -hmm. which is um, which is basically you kind of write write a rough outline of what happens in each panel, um, and then he kind of comes back with. With like kind of a rough drawing of each one and estimates how many panels would be on each page, and then after he's done with that, I do the dialogue. So it was very much a collaborative process, and uh, it was a little bit, I, as I understand, it was a little bit tougher than how the comic process normally goes, because I think a lot of, from as I understand it, like a lot of people like write what happens in each one and then write the dialogue underneath, and then the artist has to conform to that um but i think we got a great result from what the way that we did it uh but and i and i learned a ton i think honestly if if i'm gonna do this some more in the future i think i have a real good leg up on how to do it and how to do it effectively and how to do it much more efficiently than i did this last time so um i will tell you that my editor david marriott will probably tell you that each script got better as the as the time went, as as we went through, I made a real boneheaded error error with my first <laughs> script, um, uh, and in the process and how, of how I did it, it was, I mean, it was just it was just coming from a perspective of ignorance because I'd never done it before. So um, by the end, I think I was pretty pretty good uh, in terms of how I was able to format everything. So, but it took me it took me. Uh, really the four issues to really become effective and good at it and I want another chance so to, <laughs> to, to tell another story properly moving forward 
I hope you get that chance. And we'll talk about that too in a second here. But I, uh, Livio is, you're right about him. Uh, I met him probably like eight years ago. And I was doing my first comic book, which was um, a book called Soul Star, where uh, I pitched to DC Comics. I'm a big DC fan. And I pitched to them a Superman story. And I said I wanted to do a single issue and release it. And sales proceeds would go to the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. Um, and they were nice enough to listen to my pitch, but they were at that time doing something for the Horn of Africa. And I guess they weren't allowed to do multiple charities in, in a certain amount of time. So uh, so they had to decline me. So I went and created Soul Star out of Superman. I just made a Japanese version of Superman. Um, and I gave him a new origin and everything. And so we created this comic. And Levio was one of 153 artists. Uh, we had every page drawn by a different artist. Um, and oh, e- wow. And everyone worked for free. It turned out we were, a, we actually, for like three months, would have been a Guinness Book World Records holder for most artists on a single graphic novel. But I think then, a, like, after I had uh, tried to apply, someone else had beat us by like, 30 artists <laughs> uh, oh. so we were, so we were close to doing that and that would have been great for headlines because we were trying to raise awareness for the brain aneurysm foundation or just brain aneurysm gen in general that was the whole point of the project was awareness and um, Levio I met him there I mean I, I, I had reviewed his transformer comics that he was doing with Flint Dilly and and, uh, um, and uh, I'm thinking of his name Chris Metzen I think and they had a done yeah. uh, they had done autocracy around that time and um and I was reading it, and I loved it. And so I, that was kind of my early YouTube videos was reviewing it. And I be, kind of met them through that. And so Levy was like, hey, I'll do something for you. And so I've known him for years, and I can speak to how amazing of a person he is. And that method you talked about that you did, um, you know, is kind of known as the Marvel method. Uh, there's a lot of, yeah, yeah they kind of Marvel, because uh, I worked at Top Cow too for a while, and they sometimes do the Marvel method where it's, yeah, they give you an outline, and the artist kind of, flesh that out to some thumbnails works it's very collaborative and then there is the writers who who i think secretly want to be screenwriters and they just come in and they have like a full script for like a screenplay and uh, and the and like yeah. you said the artist has to conform to it and i think i feel like there's pros and cons of both versions but if you really want your artist to shine i think the method you did lets the artist have more freedom um which is which yeah. is good for a visual medium um, yeah, and you know the part of, part of the problem was that uh, we got like <laughs> I, I was trying to do it off of some of what Livio was doing with some of the rough ones. So like with issue three, for example, Livio did some of the rough outlines and whatnot, and and I went ahead and wrote the dialogue for the rough outlines, and I didn't wait for his final art, and then a lot of it changed in between. So <laughs> yeah. like when I said. I was just trying to be an A plus student, you know. Mm-hmm. I was trying to get it in as quickly as possible and make the editors' jobs easier. But it turned out that, it, like, by doing it that way, I wound up making their jobs harder. So, I mean, a lot of it was a great, great learning process for me. Right. Um, and like I, I think that you know, by issue four, I kind of like had it down. Um, there was still. You know, there were some things that obviously needed to be changed because of the continuity of what Brian Ruckley was doing and, and whatnot right. of things that I originally wrote in there. But, you know, those were things that I couldn't help and I wasn't aware of. But, um, but yeah, so, I, I mean, it was it, – honestly, it was a fantastic learning process. And, uh, and I think that we got some really great issues out of it, and I'm, something that I'm super proud of. You should be, man. And so should I start the hashtag release the Blazinski cut? <laughs> <laughs> extra, two, extra issue, two extra issues of content? Um, yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll say before we wrap this up, I, one of the other things you did in your run, and like I said, I don't want to go too much into a lot of spoilers because I want people to go read it, and people probably already see my reviews, but I still encourage you guys, go check out Transformers Galaxies 1 through 4. But something else you add in there, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I love the Constructicons, I love Devastator, but I've always been really pulled into characters like the Junkions and the Insecticons, and you did a version of the Insecticons in here that I in, in, I am insanely in love with. Uh, you did this version where they're basically like, their hunger has grown and evolved and mutated and malformed to where they're at a point now where like in the book, I don't want to say specifically what they're eating. They start off eating one thing and then by the end, they're something completely different. Where did the idea come from to make them 
kind of these tortured beings that have this appetite that will never be sated. <laughs> it's uh it was funny because it's so I was sitting out back one day and I was uh, out, out my backyard and I was I was like my dog was out there with me and I was waiting for her to kind of do her business and I was watching this spider that was like on one of our trees and I was watching it carefully and kind of like how it was doing its work and um, it had captured like a big old insect and I saw it like it, it, the insect was like bigger than it was and mm-hmm. it like it was starting to consume it basically <laughs> and I started and I started to think like and I, I get that arachnids technically aren't insects like they're two totally different things sure. but you know I, I started to think man what if what if an insect like, like what if the insecticons literally like had such a hunger to power themselves over and over again and then not only that but could kind of change what they ate into something different like so that they they became almost um weapons of war in a sense um and so it was also something that was very disturbing for the people of cyber or the people the uh (laughs) the beings of cybertron to see like them doing this deed with things like it was enough to terrify them that you know you you see something and your mind jumps from a to z really quickly like (laughs) your conclusion about something is oh they can do this so oh my god what's the natural progression of this so um so they became a really fearful thing and i wanted to have kind of a ploy of something in my series that was just could be viewed as evil um because the constructicons i don't i I didn't want anybody to view them in this story as evil i wanted to like for lack of a better term make them a little more shades of gray than like your typical 80s cartoon right um so i wanted people to kind of like feel something for them i wanted them to feel sympathy i wanted them to feel empathy and and uh feel them to feel sad and and i think livio did a phenomenal job like capturing the moods of of them so i wanted them to have kind of a foil of something that was pure evil to like kind of take over and and basically manipulate them into seeing what the reality was like sometimes reality can be harsh but it can also be a great motivator if you see what the reality is like (laughs) like you can avoid stepping on a scale for so long but the minute that you step on that scale, it becomes a reality that you got to get your butt on the treadmill real quick. Um, <laughs> like, like, like for them, it was like seeing the reality of what their circumstances were to make them stand up and take notice and have the means to be able to do it. And having the Insecticons not only be like kind of the manipulators, but also be the means for them to do it. Um, <laughs> the in, in issue four, the Insecticons have kind of a disturbing moment. Yeah, I, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> and, and I I actually wrote it even more disturbing than it actually the final one <laughs> turned out to be. Um, uh, and which, I mean, I guess it's probably a good thing because my kids read the comics. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I, I really wanted them to be like, you, I wanted people to be revolted by them, but also at the same time, uh, also empathize with the fact that they were. They, it was literally the function that they were created for. Like right. they didn't really have. They didn't really have a choice. It's either this or they don't exist. Right. So like, so uh, and everybody's going to choose existence over not existing. So um, so you know. Uh, but then I also gave them. The personalities where they took like kind of great pleasure in it as well which is where the evil part comes in so that was that to me i wanted to make them creepy i wanted to make them disturbing i wanted to make them um i wanted to make them the, a means to an end um but i also wanted people to realize that 
man, what would you do in this situation if you didn't really have a choice? Like, <laughs> you've been banned as well. You don't really have a choice, but to try and, you know, to use a great term earlier, they'll never be sated, but they don't, they don't really have, they'll never be satiated. They'll never be enough for them. So, like, that's a curse. Like, imagine that curse being levied upon you. And then everybody looks at you with disgust. I think you might become a little evil, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was the the heartbreaking thing for me when I was reading them was it was like, hey, you know, because how many of us are born into things that we have no control over? And there are times where society makes us feel that we should we should be deemed evil for it. And then there are times where, you know, we should be um, you know empathized for it. And in this case, these guys were just branded as evil and they just were like, yeah, but is it evil to survive? And that's the question that you kind of ask with them, which is amazing because these are characters that I've always liked physically and I've always liked their, you know, how they speak and how they talk in the movie and the animated cartoon and stuff. But I've never put any thought into who they were. And this was like that first time where I was like, oh, that's tragic. Like, because maybe they don't have a choice or they were conditioned to not feel like they ever do have a choice. And whereas the, uh, you know, the, the Constructicons, they have this building choice. Like, hey, you have the choice to build and that's your art. Imagine if your art is to devour. Um, and, yeah. And that was heartbreaking. I really was. Like, it made me go, okay, they're evil, but not by choice. And I feel bad for them. I feel bad that they were born into that existence. And so, no, I, I, that's why I had to bring it up. I was like, I, I know it's a Constructicons uh, comic, but I'm so glad you included them. And I'm glad you added that level to them. It was one of my favorite things in the book, to be honest with you. Yeah, thanks. The it's funny because the Insecticons were always like kind of the easy farter to be able to kill, like in the in the movie and everything. Right. Like you know, Kickback's head getting run over <laughs> and then them getting tossed out and yeah. the tossed out of Astro Train and all the. And I just you know I, they were all always like talking about the quality of the food they were eating and all that other stuff. I just wanted to give extra layers to that. Um, and then, like I said, give them a little bit of a creepy, almost vampiric, like vibe to them. So, um, like, like you know, how people talk about vampires and how you know what a curse it must be not only to like have to drink blood, but like mm. to have to stay out of daylight and all the other stuff. Mm, like, live forever. And yeah, exactly. Mm. Live forever. Mm. See anybody that you love die. All the, all this other stuff. So I wanted to give them a little bit of a vampire curse. So. That's awesome. It's again, it was, it's cool. It's cool to see that too, because like I said, I have my favorites like Junkion. So of course, I've thought of like a million different origins for Junkions, probably much like you have for Constructicons. And so it was just, it's cool like that. I and mean, that's my favorite thing about any fandom that I don't think a lot of people do embrace is the differences. Like, oh, you have your favorites, I have mine. That shouldn't divide us. That should unite us. And um, so hearing yeah. hearing that is just is great. And, and hearing you put that much thought into it, I, I really do. And uh, so I guess that leads to my my kind of my last question, which is, you know, if you could return to you know another Galaxy's miniseries. Which Transformers would you write? And please, if IDW is listening to this, please have him back on because <laughs> I I, re- I really loved his issues, and I liked I I read five and six of Galaxies, and they were good too. But I I really do love what you brought to this universe. So, yeah, I'd love to know if 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 you could come back and what you would like to write. Uh, first of all, thank you. I you know, like I said, starting off all this, it's the biggest compliment to me that somebody who's a hardcore Transformers fan loved it um, that was like a goal when I set out to to do this is that I wanted to I wanted to appeal to the hardcore and maybe go a little deeper than the Transformers have ever gone on the Constructicons and so and even the Insecticons to an extent so um, that that was that that means a lot to me that that you enjoyed it that much but to me, honestly, like um, the Constructor Cons are my favorite. I have a lot of favorites too. Like Thrust is one of my favorites. I love Blitzwing. Blitzwing's what Blitzwing's toy to me is one of the all-time greatest toys because it was so. I mean, the ease of play with it was amazing. You could transform him so easily. Um, so like, it was natural to be able to like play and have them transform from a jet to a tank to a robot really quickly which you know i don't think a lot of the designers think about these days they have all the 
they have a lot of the toys that are super incredible that look just like they do in the cartoon but the ease of transforming them has become so complicated that like my 10 year old son has to watch youtube videos in order to be able to do it and (laughs) when you're sitting on the floor playing with your boy like him taking 20 minutes to be able to transform somebody from one mode to another just doesn't make it that much fun so like (laughs) and i wonder how many people are actually sitting on the floor playing with their kids with these things so that's one of the things that i loved about blitzwing as a toy not only that but it's colors and stuff and obviously megatron soundwave was a huge one too because he was super easy to transform as well plus you could get out his cassettes really easily and um but honestly you know it I've become really attached through this process to the Constructicons. Like, um, I guess when you create something like this, you develop an, an extreme emotional attachment. And I would love to take the Constructicons to their next natural evolution. Um, like, where would they go after this? They obviously wouldn't be welcome back on Cybertron. Um, so, like, what's their fate? how do they come into the Decepticon fold? Because we know they come into the Decepticon fold. So how does that transpire? Um, what, where do they wind up going? Because you know that, you know, if one of the colony worlds that's producing Energon suddenly disappears mysteriously, like Roanoke, Virginia, like what <laughs> Cybertron's going to like try and figure out what's going on up there. So they wouldn't stay there. Um, I just, I would love to take their story forward. Like, like, don't you think somebody like Scavenger, like who was so young and naive and kind of like the little brother throughout the whole, the, the little littlest brother throughout this whole thing, don't you think that maybe he might have a little PTSD from all this? Don't you think that like, like I just, I'm so excited by these characters that like there's a, I, there's like a real urgency for me to be able to like, take them under the Decepticon fold. I mean, heck, I would love to do something like what Marvel does, like, you know, have individual X-Men stories about each one of these, like, monthly. Like, just call it Transformers Constructicons and just go crazy with it, them on a, on a monthly basis. Like, I, I just, like, there's so many opportunities for, or heck, Transformers Insecticons and explore where they're going next and what's up with them because they're getting a trip back to Cybertron. So like, how do how do they coexist? How do they hide? How do they meet their hunger needs? Like to me, there's so many questions that arose from my series that I almost like there's a real desperate need for me to get back to it and tell more of these stories. Um, I, so, and I hope you get to man. I just hearing you, it's like you're. You're a world builder uh, for sure, and you're and like I said, you're an agent of change, and uh, uh, you've definitely changed my perspective. And I'm a 30 year, you know, 30 plus year <laughs> Transformer fan, and uh, and you've made me look at these characters that I've already loved in completely new ways. And yeah, I mean, just think about it, IDW. Like as someone who's one of your biggest fans and buys all your Transformer stuff, like give them another series. You could release like a like a nice two three hard covers called Constructicons. I'll buy them all. They'll look so good on my shelf and everyone else's shelf. <laughs> Um, uh, but Brian, I mean, one thing is, you know, one, I appreciate you making this time. I mean, you know, we've talked for over an hour now and I, I've, I feels like it went by in like 10 minutes. I, I love talking to you. You're such a nice guy. I would love to have you on again at some point down the road. And, uh, and also like, I just, thanks for sharing your passions and your viewpoints and your, you know, I mean, you, you're in, just in this episode talking to you and doing research on you and stuff. It's like, you've actually started to inspire things changes i'm trying to make in my life of just noticing the 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 hamster wheel i'm on and then also the change i want out there like i i don't like that a lot of youtubers especially ones that cover comics have a negative like it's really hard to get people to watch my show um sometimes because i'm a youtuber and people go oh he does youtube comics then he's probably negative and it's like well check out the show like you know i try to be if i'm negative i try to be constructive and that's what i try to do is just be constructive and just be positive and i i want to bring that change too and seeing that you've done it and you and you push so hard and and made these big you know leaps in your life it means a lot man you sound like a great dad a great husband and a hard worker and that's also uh really cool and so uh thank you for making the time to be here today honestly it's been my pleasure seek i've enjoyed talking to you a ton and uh 
good luck with your new job. I'm, I'm, you know, and and congratulations on on really being a survivor. And uh, uh, you know, it's I, I can't imagine what you went through and what the experience was like. But I imag- I have to believe that it had to give you an unbelievable fundamental appreciation of life that some of us might never have. Even those of us who've been touched by death, like to be touched by it, not just by seeing it in someone you love by, but by basically being at death store yourself, like that has to just, I can't imagine what that must be like and, and, uh, what it must be like to wake up every day and, and take some deep breaths and, and be able to just, relax and appreciate the fact that you're still here and still able to make some great content and still be able to be a positive person because honestly when you've been through what you've been through um how can you not be positive how can you let the minutia and the little things of life get you down so uh keep powering forward and and, uh congratulations on the new job and and i appreciate you having me on for so long it's really been a pleasure oh no problem i I did not deserve those kind words but they're very much appreciated and um yeah my friend said uh he said you know it's it's tough that not only were you at death door but you're always at death door because i have new aneurysms pop up quite frequently actually i have a proclivity to them um so i'm i'm constantly going and getting scanned and checked um you know to make sure we can stop the next one so you know it's uh you're right every day is a literal um, wake up and take a breath and go all right I'm here let's get to work uh, so yeah. so uh, no I appreciate it and uh, and it's it's very kind of you to say that and, and acknowledge that and make so much time for a fan like me and uh, and to share these stories with your life so where can people find you on social media so that they can continue to follow your life and and the stuff you create well as I said earlier the most important thing for me is uh, is family and being a dad so um, my nickname when I first started out, uh, my last name is Blazinski, so everybody always called me Blez, B-L-E-Z. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I figured I will never have a more important title than Poppy. <laughs> so, uh, uh, my uh, my wife is Mexican, so my children are Mexican, so they they all they call me Poppy. So um, I go by Poppy Blez everywhere. So uh, it's P-A-P-I B-L-E-Z. Um, and that's on Twitter. Uh, I have a public Instagram, but that's mostly family stuff. So unless you're bored by family, uh, <laughs> don't don't follow me there. Uh, sometimes I actually have a custom Devastator bike that I uh, that I take pictures of my bike when I go out on bike rides. So that's occasionally there. Um, but yeah, I I uh, I go by Poppy Blaz pretty much everywhere. So. Um, because, like I said, there will never be a more more important title than I'll have than Poppy. So. That's awesome. And, now, guys, I'll put a link to that down below, to his Instagram and his Twitter. And then also I'll put a link to the uh, Volume 2 hardcover that is going to be coming out that has the four issues of Galaxies in this. And for those of you who want more Transformer content, I will be reviewing more comics soon. And I'll also be uh, actually interviewing your partner in crime on this series, Livio Ramondelli. I'll get him on the show coming up very soon as well. Um, uh, Livio is a much Livio is a much better interview than me. He's much more succinct. So. <laughs> hey, that's a, that's all right. Every once in a while, I got to put out a good hour episode and uh, and see you know. <laughs> but this was so good, and I appreciate your time. So thanks again for being here, Tyler. Anytime, Seek. All right, we'll see you next time. And everyone else out there, transform and roll out. Stop! Stop! Uh, uh, I am Bumblebee, your oldest friend, Optimus. I would lay down my life for you.